as we're looking at content or inputting content into, um, you know, these, these uh, communications, okay, we'll track who's clicking on it. And as, as somebody is engaging with your content, and if they're engaging on a regular basis, let's score that. So now you have a score associated with it and you say, okay, this is somebody that's probably less than a cold prospect. Like they're probably warm because they're engaging with our stuff. So we should put more of a human emphasis on reaching out to them at that point and using our time wisely in that way, rather than trying to boil the ocean as humans. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the EITR podcast. My name is Stephanie Pfeiffer. I'm the CTO and co-founder of EITR Technologies. Today at the end, we have Nicholas Hughes sporting a beautiful EITR shirt. He is CEO and co-founder of EITR Technologies. And joining us today is Ross Hecox, the founder and creator of ScuttleGov. Thank you for having me. I'm Thank excited you for to be being here today. Here. We're very excited. <laughs> and today we are talking about AI's impact on recruiting. Yes. Yes. Exciting. So Ish. Nick and I have only dabbled in the recruiting area, but yeah. we've dove our heads a little bit into the AI yep. area. Yep. You are our resident expert recruiter. Yes. So Ross, I don't know, as our res resident recruiting yes. expert, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and how yes. you got into the game and a little bit about ScuttleGo? Yeah, for sure. So I fell into recruiting back um, about 20, over 20 years ago. I'll just say that. Uh, so I don't give away my, my full age. Um, again, fell into it. It wasn't anything that I ever thought I would be going into. It, it fell in my lap. So I, I kind of took off and ran with it from there. What, what I loved about recruiting was kind of the personal um, connection points with recruiting. And, uh, you know, I, I think what excites me about this conversation with regards to AI and recruiting is where that intersection of, you know, what should remain personal and then what are some of the things that we can leverage AI um, to benefit recruiters and candidates alike uh, moving forward? So 20 plus years recruiting, uh, moved from recruiting to leading teams and then moving into HR. So on a, on a broader level, I'll probably share a little bit more about um, AI and HR as well. Awesome. Um, just based on some of the experience I've had there and where I think it can really impact. You can share uh, whatever HR. you want. Man. Awesome. I love it. I love sharing it. Thanks, man. Caring. I, sharing is caring. I got permission. Ready to rock and roll. <laughs> love it. Sweet. Well, just for a little bit of a backstory, yes. Ross actually recruited me to one of the companies I ended up joining. So I'm yes. very aware That's with right. his human tactics. Yeah. Um, and I'm very interested on your insights and how that moves sure. into AI. Yeah, for sure. Good. Good stuff. Um, so I'll, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of kick off here um, with regards to, to AI and maybe AI and recruiting. Um, and I, my thoughts around AI, and I'm sure everybody that's watching this understands what AI is uh, and what that stands for. But I think that um, one of the things that we have to be careful about with AI, especially in recruiting or in, in any uh, regards is, is what it is good for and what it's not necessarily good for. And I think, um, you know, at a very high level, from a recruiting standpoint, I don't know that it's where it needs to be to take over a lot of the interaction with humans. But I think it's great leverage, leveraged for things like creating job descriptions, um, you know, proofreading job descriptions, things of that nature that are really mundane human tasks that create burnout for recruiters. A lot of recruiters who have to spend time combing through writing job descriptions. And you know, in this industry, as well as I do, that, you know, you, you can be on a program that has 100 plus openings and you're thinking to yourself, well, how am I going to write a job description for all of these openings? This is going to take me forever. So you end up kind of copying and pasting from a labor category perspective. And then that's what you get across all jobs. And I think there's an opportunity to leverage things like ChatGPT to write those jobs to job descriptions for you so that they're unique, they're compelling and not. Yeah, I think the, the unique same. part really sinks in with yeah. me because I feel like with all the different jobs that pop up in this space, they end up being redundant. You lose a lot of the substance and the specialness that I need on each right. particular job. And if ChatGPT can keep me square on that, that's huge. Yeah. I so, like that. I don't know. I'll, I guess I'll play devil's advocate here. Love it. Um, <laughs> so with job descriptions in particular, right? Um, first of all, they're terrible generally. Generally speaking, right? you're absolutely right. Um, 
you know, 99% of the ones that you see in both commercial and government sectors are just like, they threw a bunch of words on a page, right? right? Like nobody reads that anymore because it's, you know, a huge paragraph of, you know, like uh, high level uh, sentences right. that are, are very right. like legalese type right. speak. Right. And then, you know, 17 pages of skills that are maybe related and maybe not. Correct. Um, so job descriptions are, are not my favorite thing in the world. But, um, you know, going on from that, right? Like if we're talking about ChatGPT being able to make them better, um, like how would you see that playing out? Yeah. So I'll say, listen, I'm not an expert on uh, ChatGPT prompts, right? And I think that's where a lot of the magic comes into play with, with AI and things like ChatGPT. So, so prompt engineering, um, which is evidently a, a new labor category yeah. or job description, <laughs> um, you know, it it's, 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 takes some finesse, yes. right? But ultimately what it is is uh, what particular words do I need to put in in order to get the outcome that I want. Correct. So let's work backwards, yep. right? Like you can think about the outcome that you want. Mm -hmm. What kind of outcome would you want to see from that? So what I personally take away from this are things um, like writing from a team perspective rather than an individual perspective, right? So if we think about the psychology behind recruiting people, humans, what's important to people, mm -hmm. right? Is it working independently or is it working as part of a team? Right. And depending on where you are in your um, your career level, if you're just, you know, just starting out, you're going to benefit from being a part of a team. So if I'm prompting chat GPT, I want to prompt it with something that that speaks more to this idea of being a part of a team. Now, if I'm senior level, principal level and, uh, you know, and there, there, there's a, a position for that somewhere, you might want to make a prompt that's a little bit more based on autonomy, independence, influence, things of that nature from a higher level um, so that the, the job description comes out tailored more towards um, those personal interests than just a standard uh, yeah, job description. I think that's that's a really good point, because a lot of times what you see um, in that spectrum from like, you know, junior to more senior folks, um, the change in job description generally has to do with years, yeah. which I hate. Yes. Um, and it also has to do with like, you might get a little bit of leadership language in, in, in the, <laughs> right. the senior stuff, but yeah. that, that's about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's, that would be a great thing to add. I think that would be, yeah. uh, you know, useful. Yeah. And I, I think another pl place that we can play around with it as well is from a diversity perspective that when we look at a lot of the language revolving job descriptions, um, it, they're inherently written like biased almost towards men and you know it's like we're looking for a rock star well i think historically and traditionally speaking that rock stars have been thought of as men right? i think of them as stephanie i'm offended i'm offended i'm saying rock traditionally star. from a, a i like a where your picture. head's at we yeah. can move forward yes. we need yeah. everyone to know that i'm a rock star that's right exactly so, so we, we want so rock star specific things aside <laughs> yeah so we want to make sure that the, the type of language that's being produced is also inclusive yeah I agree with that. So I, I had a, a brief discussion with our intern, Natalie, this morning, um, and I told her about the topic. And that was the first thing that she said was like diversity and inclusion and things like that. And um, I joked a little bit, but it's, it's not far from the truth. Like if you asked AI to, you know, create a picture with like Dolly or whatever other thing, right. mid journey of an IT team. How, what percentage of them would actually be white males? Yeah, right. Like probably a really large. Yeah, ninety-two. Be, like, be ner nerdy-looking white guys <laughs> in, in, in a in a picture, right? That's right? And so, like, that's that's the type of bias that we yeah. need to fight against. Um, I guess in creating ethical and responsible AI. Yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, again, I I think there are some some really valid opportunities with AI. Um, I don't want to remove that human component, right? I mean, when we start thinking about how AI can look at, you know, massive amounts of resumes is one of, and we, we probably should segment this a little bit from the perspective of, you know, we have recruiting within the Intel community, which is one animal. And then we have recruiting from a broader perspective, which is another animal where any given job can have hundreds of 
candidates applying for it, right? That's one challenge. In Intel, you don't necessarily have that challenge. No. <laughs> so, you, you know, big picture recruiting AI has some additional benefits from, you know, maybe whittling down resumes, but there's still going to be some bias. There's still going to be some human components of, um, of, of time. But if you have, let's say you have 200 resumes and you can leverage AI to boil that down into 20 resumes, mm -hmm. right? And you only have to review 20 as opposed to 200, you're saving yourselves a heck of a lot of time. You're able to get back to candidates faster because I think that's another big component of this is looking at it from the candidate's perspective of, I submitted a resume you know, three weeks ago and I haven't heard anything. And meanwhile, the team is maybe combing through hundreds of resumes or maybe they're just lazy and have bad habits. They're not communicating and not responding. So we can leverage AI for things like automation. Right. Mm -hmm. And being able to, to to keep these candidates informed of where we are in the process, um, you know, without having to do one off emails and things of that nature. Um, so on a broad on a broad level, I think there are a lot of really great opportunities to leverage AI. But I do not want to take away that human element and component gonna, of, of interacting. I was going to say, well. like, how much trust would you have and would you need to have in an AI before you said, here That's, are 100 yeah, resumes. Right. Now tell me the top 20. That's right. And I, I think um, and I know there are tools out there now. I don't have experience playing with a lot of them. So, again, I think it comes down to, you know, what what language models are available to to leverage in order to identify what your organization considers the top type of candidates, right? So for example, if you have AI and it's combing through a list of keywords and it's spitting out 20 resumes of uh, people that have these keywords, but all of them have had six jobs in the last two years, that's probably not the best fit for your company, right? right. So there still needs to be some aspect of, okay, how can we train this? How can we develop it to, to suit the needs of our organization rather than what AI thinks is the most appropriate, you know, output of something, right? right? Yeah. I, I get a little philosophical at times and I, I often question, do we really want robots to think like humans? Like we're, we're pretty screwed up bunch, <laughs> right? At the end of the day. Uh, so do we really fair. want that to happen? <laughs> I, I, I thought similar, similar things, right? Like for e even from a movement perspective, yeah. you know, why are they always trying to create these robots that, that look and move like humans? Yes. You know, if you, if you take a step back, you know, we're, we're trying to replace humans in current spots where, you know, maybe there's only room for humans or things like that. But can we can we retool whole, the whole process so that we don't need a, a, a human like robot anymore? Right. right? Yeah. Like yeah. maybe yeah. let's turn it on its head. Some yes. some something similar. Yeah. Right. Like, That's do, right. You, do, do we want them to, to think like us? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's a scary thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you talked a little like a lot about the recruiting process, but you had mentioned like how do we use AI to help the recruit E? Like yeah. how do we help? I guess that would help people find jobs that are better suited for them. Like what are your ideas there? Yeah, I think on the the flip side, right? So it's if I am a uh, a candidate, a job seeker, um, and I'm looking, um, what tools are actually available for me? to automate this process so that I'm not spending, you know, eight hours a day just combing through Indeed and things of that nature. And a lot of those platforms will have, um, you know, opportunities for you to create a profile and they'll share with you jobs that match that profile, right? Now, from that point though, I, you know, I'm not familiar with any real um, great solutions that allow for, you know, interaction from a, a candidate perspective from that point forward. If they have a profile on some sort of a platform, job board, um, you know, they, they, their profile is going to be seen by these organizations, or maybe they hit a button and it submits to the organization for review and things of that nature. Um, but from a follow-up standpoint, things of that, I don't know of anything available right now that allows that to occur from a prospect side of the house and saying, you know, okay, let me set a um, let me set a tickler um, that automatically sends out a note to this employer uh, in four days. Hey, I sent this. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I sent a, a, a 
uh, resume over, haven't heard from you guys, just want to get an idea of where things are. And, you know, just we have automation tools on the flip side, right, for sales, lead generation, things of that nature, where there's a workflow that you can establish that's, you know, okay, message one goes out and here's message one crafted. And then you set the time in, in space between and message two is a follow up message and message three is another follow up message. And you can set the time and space between each one. There's nothing like that for candidates right now. It's probably mm -hmm. a good opportunity um, to leverage um, some of these tools and re rethink the applicability to you know prospects. So again, I'm a candidate, I submit something, I set up my workflow, and then you know once every three or four days, a message is being sent automatically to each one of these uh, organizations that I've applied to following up. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, again, most of what happens is like, if you're an active job seeker and you send out a bunch of resumes, what's the chance that you're following up with all 100 of those jobs? It's probably, you know, slim to none. It's like that a you, job you know, to like, do that. that. That's right. It's it's, <laughs> it's its its own job and you're going to miss certain things and so on and so forth. So you could potentially increase your um, chances of getting hired by an organization by leveraging some sort of automation technology uh, or AI uh, on that side. So, so. again, I'm, I'm probably going to like think a little bit too far outside the box right here. But um, so we're talking about candidate out. Uh, outreach to employers, right? You know, if we're automating those tasks, you know, I haven't heard anything back from from these folks. Let me go ahead and, and send a message out to them or something like that. Um, if if employers are independently automating communications as well, what we have then is basically robots exchanging emails, right? Yes. So you know, we have this some like some sort of response back, even if it's automated to the point where they have insight into the process where you know they can say like oh hey you know yeah this is jerry he reached out to us i recognize this email let me look up jerry's email in our you know uh portal okay yeah he's with this person you know generally that process takes this many days he's halfway through it let me send an email back right like that would be super cool right right but we had a robot sending it and a robot uh uh responding to it for me, that's like a, another scenario where we're having robots do human things when maybe we should have robots do robot things. Yes. Right. Like if there was a platform in which there was tighter integration mm -hmm. and the candidate could just be kept informed without having to reach out to a human being, um, you know, they could know the, the point at which they could send yeah. an actual email and get, you know, they're like, OK, I've gotten far enough in this process yes. that I'm actually going to be considered. Um, as opposed to, you know, I'm still waiting to be evaluated or something like that. And I think what you're raising is a really interesting point around who has ownership mm -hmm. of being kept in the loop. Yeah. Right. And I, we, we often say, you know, it's the employer, right? I applied to you and I expect for you to show me some respect and return that I've applied and that you've received my resume and that I'm in consideration or not in consideration. And if that's not, you know, happening and let's face it, it's not, it's not happening on a regular basis. I, I think, um, oftentimes recruiters are very, um, I think a lot of recruiters come from a, a very empathetic background and perspective and they don't like delivering the good news. They want the good hit. They want to feel good about progress and, and things of that nature, but it becomes, you know, a little bit more, uh, difficult for recruiters to end up following up with somebody that maybe a hiring manager has rejected. And now it's like, wah, wah, wah. Um, recruiters have to do better. Uh, in the absence of recruiters doing better, can AI fix what some recruiters lack? And that, so that, that's another type of a question that I think we get to, um, because all the AI in the world is, is, is probably not going to make up for, for a recruiter that doesn't have uh, maybe altruistic intentions. I think it also becomes a scale problem too, right? Like, you know, we, we talked about Intel being a different animal and yes. you know, there's smaller hiring pools yes. and things like that. Um, it may be a lot easier to keep up with th things like yep. that in commercial spaces. Yep. Um, you know, every time we put out a job description, uh, we get no less than 150 immediate applications yeah. from somebody that's probably scraping it, Correct. you know, um, yeah, that's right. and, and automating responses or something like that. And we just don't have the bandwidth as a small business to be able to, to say, 
no to all these 150 people who incidentally aren't qualified at all anyway. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's it's it almost becomes a problem of, you know, what do you want to pay your human labor to do? Right. You know, you want your your recruiters to be shoveling coal into the fire. Right. Like they want to be filling the funnel with with people. Absolutely. But once they're into it, like, is it the responsibility to, like, see things coming out yeah. of like some sort of uh, diversion hopper saying oh, it's not going to go down to the bottom? Like that becomes a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, this is where this conversation is really interesting because AI can be leveraged from a, a bunch of different perspectives within the overall recruiting process. Where it's most applicable based on its maturity now is, is you know, a question to ask yourself. Uh, you touched on something that it, that's, that's the shoveling coal. Um, I think of that as, you know, that, that's, that's your pipeline development, right? You're, you're, you're developing pipeline. I think AI has a really good space or good, good opportunity in that space for um, candidate nurturing, right? So, um, you know, all too often we, we, you know, it's in any organization and it's like, hey, we've got a database of 9,000, you know, fully cleared uh, candidates. All right. So how many did you hire last year? Oh, we hired 20. Is that good? It sounds pretty bad if you have a database of, of 9,000, 9, yeah. right? So why is that? And then the, the response you get, well, there's just not enough of us, right? We don't have enough time in the day. We don't, or, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing other things. So if you can leverage something like a candidate nurture strategy where you're leveraging AI to help keep these 9,000 people informed of what's going on in your organization, all of the great opportunities that exist, some content that might be of interest to that person, um, and then track it, right? So as we're, as we're looking at content or inputting content into, um, you know, these, these uh, communications, okay, we'll track who's clicking on it. And as, as somebody is engaging with your content, and if they're engaging on a regular basis, let's score that. So now you have a score associated with it and you say, okay, this is somebody that's probably less than a cold prospect. Like they're probably warm because they're engaging with our stuff. So we should put more of a human emphasis on reaching out to them at that point and using our time wisely in that way rather than trying to boil the ocean as humans. Mm. I think like that's... Yeah, that, that's like a really cool concept. It's almost a, applying sales and marketing strategy. 100% it is. To, that's right. To candidate development. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty smart thing. Yeah. I like that a lot because I'm thinking to myself, like, where is that gate in the workflow from recruiter and recruitee of, like, where do I put the human? Yes. Where should the human come in? Yeah. But if there's a score that tells the human, hey, this person's scoring above a... 2.7 on Whatever a four scale. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. You're like, time for you to wake up and human. Yes, and human. That's right. <laughs> wake up and human. Human, like human. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and then, you know, just things such as uh, policy development, policy creations, things of that nature that you can leverage um, AI for. Um, what, what I would always say is, you know, what we want to do is be able to leverage it to do some creation, but we always want to run this stuff back through like legal or something along those lines, because we're, we're just not at a place, place right now where we can trust what's coming back, right? So um, if you have a policy to develop or create, or you want to create some sort of a, um, you know, an email template that you're going to send out to people, uh, things of that nature that can really help someone um, who may not have the time to sit down and dedicate four, four hours of their day to like writing, rewriting, uh, let's do that. And then let's, let's check it against, you know, if it's a policy, again, let's check it against legal. Um, let's make sure that, you know, it's, it's legit and then we can move forward with it. Uh, really cutting down the time involved, you know, and to push some of this stuff out. Is that sort of where you see AI branching into the HR world? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, Makes 100%. Sense. Yeah, I don't want HR, um, you know, to, to, to become AI, right? That's, that's it's not, not a called good thing. robot resources. That's right. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <Hilarious. laughs> exactly. R R. Yeah. It's not R R. Um, so we don't want that to happen. All right. That's right. <laughs> awesome. So, um, I want to take that email template concept and walk it back to what you said at the very beginning. And I'm impressed that I actually remember that you said this. So, um, towards the beginning, you said, Hey, you know, I want to keep some interactions human to human, right? Um, and I think it was in the context of outreach. So I get 
templated emails all the time. Yes. You, you can tell. Yes. Right. Hundred percent. Um, and you know, there's like LinkedIn outreach and things like that. People have resorted yep. to putting emojis in their name, yes. and so they can say, "Oh, yeah, this That's is right. clearly, yeah. you know, somebody didn't type this." That's right. Um, because they typed the emoji. Um, I just spell out the emoji incidentally. Like if somebody puts a cloud in front of it, like <laughs> yeah. I know a guy that that uh, that um, works at Kion, and um, his name is Randall, and he has a cloud in front of it, and so I call him Cloud Randy. <laughs> and that's how I communicate with him. Um, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. But, you know, your point is understood. the point is yeah. uh, automating. Right. Yeah. So so automating that outreach, the the email templates and stuff like that. You know, a lot of uh, organizations have found that to be a time saver when they're talking about the work involved. Yeah. Right. Like. I, I've got to send a thousand emails, right? Like I can either type up a thousand emails or I can have, you know, this list of people sent to this email template yes. and it just does it for me. Um, you know, I guess h how can we, how can we make that a more human approach or how can AI make those templated emails better? Yeah. Because I, like those things are terrible. 80, 90% of the time. Agreed. And I, th I think that's the, the benefit of having like a chat GPT to at least give you the foundation to get you started, to get you jump, jump started. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys. Um, I wasn't an ideal student. I did a lot of <laughs> opening up Encyclopedia Britannica and copying word from word. And then I change a couple of words yeah. to make it seem like you it was change my own. a few. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I think this the same concept applies, right? It's like we can use ChatGPT to get an idea started and then make it your own. And that's going to cut down on the time because we, there's so much time spent in that, you know, the, the creative you know, like, OK, let's get the wheels turning. Let's 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 feed this idea and let's start to craft it and let's rewrite it and let's do all of this stuff. If we can get that jump started with AI and then just come back and we clean it up, that's going to that's going to help things there. Mm -hmm. Now, I will I will, you know, throw the question back to you with regards to how can we have AI like AI should be able to recognize emojis. Right. So, OK, if there's an emoji there, you'd think that'd be that step out. number one. Uh, you think? <laughs> like, missed. Yeah. Swing, miss. Right. Yeah. So, you know, from a from a, an engineering standpoint and companies that are developing this AI and things that may integrate with LinkedIn and such, like, uh, come on, people. Like, how hard is it now to just remove that or, um, you know, maybe if somebody spells out their name with its R space, A space, N space, D space, Y space, and it's, you know, Randy, like it should be able to more easily recognize that and just put it together as Randy. Yeah, I'm glad that he didn't have that in his profile because this is a lot longer to say. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, a like lot cloud, longer. Cloud Randy's Cloud easy. Randy's a lot easier. Yeah, yeah the, the, the R space, A space would, would take a little while. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, it, it's a uh, you know it's a thing where it's a tool. Um, I like to think of it kind of as like what the calculator was, right? If we think about you know a calculator and, and what that allowed um, for people to you know check answers against and things of that nature, and we can use ChatGPT in the same type of a way, and we can more easily and quickly digest information. You know, there's there's a, a, a benefit to that. Yep. Yeah, I, I hear the the calculator argument brought up a lot in um, education, right? Yeah. You know, I've got two teenage boys <laughs> and uh, my wife and I are always talking about, um, you know, whether or not it's it's right for them to be able to use tools like this that are coming out. And you know, say like, look, you know, when the calculator came out, there was a similar pushback. Yeah. Um, this is a little bit of a different scenario, right? Like it. At this point, it's it's almost like if if Wolfram Alpha wasn't um, paid to get the <laughs> yes. a paid plan to get yes. the actual like steps to get there, so that people could write it out, yep. right? Like um, if this was just open, you know, would uh, would uh, math educators be saying, hey, you know, this is a bigger problem than than just the calculator? Yeah, um, I had a good friend that's uh, been involved with. Um, math within the, the uh, school system for many, many years. And, you know, the, the idea of math being as uh, fluent as language, right, as being able to speak, you know, a language. And that, 
the idea of chat GPT and, and similar tools, um, I think is really, is that it's kind of that notion, right? For people that, that aren't necessarily good with language, uh, it's going to be an equalizer and now becomes the conversation of, well, do we want that equalizer, right? Should stupid people just be stupid, you know, <laughs> but we, you know, again, yeah. we go back to the calculator idea <laughs> and there's a calculator yeah. for people, you know, we used to have them on watches, right. And, yeah. uh, and such. Um, so it, there's this evolving kind of, um, I think, dynamic with with these tools, and it being so you know so new that we're we're really just on the front end of things. Um, yeah, a, a lot. We're going to discover a lot, you yeah. know, in the coming years. Yeah, I feel this. like I feel like it's the playing field is going to go. Yes, all over the place, and, and that hurts. It'll that hurts for somebody who invests a lot of time into their craft, right? Somebody who's invested a lot of time to be, you know, to be a good writer, to to have creative thoughts and, and have creative outlets and things of that nature. Um, that great equalizer, I think, is, you know, it's going to be upsetting to a lot of people. Yeah, I agree. But I'm hopeful that a lot of people don't find their craft in job descriptions. Correct. I, I think you. I, I think, think that's a good. I think maybe they can go somewhere else and do even better things. <laughs> even better things. The next J.K. Rowling's out there yeah. somewhere, yeah. and she better not be writing job descriptions. <laughs> it's like one human in the entire world, just like journaling every <laughs> night job descriptions. Somebody's out there. There's got to be. Probably <laughs> right. You're yeah. probably right. But again, there are people I know that do take time to yeah, I mean, the, invest in the job description. So it's like you can oh, definitely tell they you want can, that to be. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell when somebody puts together a solid job description right. that doesn't have me just looking for the bulleted list of right. what do you want from me? I, and this is where the conversation jumps off into maybe human aspects of things. Right. Because in terms of, you know, if we're using the idea of, of job descriptions as differentiators, Right. Like calling a job description, a well-written job description as a differentiator. Um, OK, so if everybody's now on an equal playing, playing field as an organization, what is your differentiator? Like, how are you attract if, if compensations commoditized, benefits have been commoditized, job descriptions have been commoditized, you know, the work is like then what becomes that differentiator? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where that human element has to come back into play. My personal belief is that, you know, we, we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And as an organization, the types of things that you want to be in, involved in with your people revolve around, you know, the highest self, right? Like, who am I destined to become? Who can I become? And what is an employer's role in that? The intersection of where life and work kind of come together um, and, you know, focusing more time there to give your... Uh, employees, you know, uh, the, I'll say the the boost from things such as autonomy, responsibility, mastery, uh, purpose, impact, those types of things, right? How do we, how do we, um, you know, take advantage of, of that? It, leverage maybe some tools to take care of the hygiene stuff, mm -hmm. right? I think AI is great for hygiene factors. Um, but from, you know, motivation factors, I think that's the human connection. That's the human connection that we need to keep. I like that. I like that. Um, bringing that back to the work life integration. Yeah. Um, I do have one bonus question for you guys. Ooh, um, bonus question. Came up with it on the fly. All right. Super exciting. Um, it's for both of you. Okay. So no stress. <laughs> um, we talked a little bit about making job descriptions. We talked a little bit about AI. Um, a lot of and about AI. on one of our a lot about AI on one of our other podcasts that should be coming out soon. Spoiler alert. We talked a little bit about how you can plan too far into a schedule and how you can understand a problem too deeply before you just have all these questions. Mm. So you should execute when you finally hit a point where you're ready to go. So at what point as you know, a job creator, can I write out what I want? Like I want to build a Web page that does this, this and this and it has these different components, it reaches out to these different APIs, who do I need to do this? And it writes my job descriptions, I give it my timeline. How far away from me from that are we? Will we ever get there? Is that something we even need as a universe? Oh, I think we could benefit from it, for sure. I think that's a, that's a, a, a great aspirational um, pursuit. Um, I you know, probably need a little bit more clarity around 
you know, AI is going to have to really understand you as a mm -hmm. human and what's important to you and your business and organization. And is it tapped into the tools and languages and, and such apps that you're using as an organization and saying, oh, okay, based on this picture, I can hit this button and boom, here's the job description that's needed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great aspirational place to, to work towards. Um, it'd be interesting from that perspective, you know, within a corporate setting where you have a lot of different recruiters, a lot of different hiring managers, a lot of different departments and how you would, you, you know, segment that or compartmentalize AI to say, oh, this Stephanie hit this button. I know Stephanie. I know what she does at this organization. I know all of the 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 the, uh, the technologies and things of that nature. Boom, easy, done and done. Mm -hmm. I I think it's a great aspirational place to to work towards. I think so. from like where the rubber meets the road type of aspect, right? Like number one, one of the failings I think of job descriptions is that generally the people writing them don't necessarily understand the work that's being done, right? Like almost always the case. Um, and when they ask for input from the people who do know, they're too busy, yes. right? Like they don't want to deal with that. We just go like, uh, so mm -hmm. like, again, it, <laughs> if, if they were like, Hey, you know, um, do you guys have like a write up of, of what you're doing? Like a high level um, goal or something like that, something in that's in a statement of work or whatever. And they just loaded that in and said, Hey, you know, write me some job descriptions for people that do this type of work and it popped out and then just had somebody check over them like that would be super cool because then it takes those people out of the loop and maybe gets you a little bit closer you know the people that are you know too technical to be right. doing job yeah. descriptions yeah. <laughs> and then you know the the, the other folks are going to get closer to what the actual job is right like because you always find these job descriptions you like you look at them like this is garbage there's nothing on here that actually is worthwhile um, but uh, it's in my niche, right? Like it's a software developer position yeah. and I'm a software developer. Yeah. Um, let me get in front of that team and ask them exactly what they do, right? Like that's what you end up doing most of the time because there's there's no like, this is what this team does yeah. type of stuff. So I'll go back to what we were earlier in, in the discussion and talking about how, you know, job descriptions um, and personalizing them, right? Like. When you're putting out a job description, do you really want it the same as the last one that you put out? Because you're not really trying to hire the same person, Yeah. right? Like most cases, you're really looking for an individual. You're looking for some diversity of thought. You're looking for somebody that can be a, a, an addition and bonus to the team, um, maybe more so rather than somebody who's just the same as, right? Now, in certain situations, if we're talking about government contracting or people on contracts and things of that nature, well, maybe not, maybe not as much. But if you're thinking about a true team working together to solve a problem, you want people that have different components of thought and ways of thinking. So yep. why should a job description uh, be the same? Absolutely. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much the, the same argument that I have when, um, you know, there's too many skills yeah right <laughs> you know essentially they're they're, yes. they're, li they're listing out the team skills yes right like this is not an individual skill right um the devops the, conversation it, or devsecops yeah, conversation exactly they're skill. like oh i want you to be able to code i want you yeah. to know infrastructure i want yeah. you to know this i want you to know that um you know it comes back to multifunctional teams and making sure that you have the right team dynamic to accomplish right. those goals yeah. so I, I think that that's a really good corollary yeah. um the the other thing that I'll say about uh, Stephanie's question in particular, um, I think that that we could probably get pretty close to that right now um, as far as being able to like load a project description and say, hey, you know, what ki what kinds of of, uh, you know, labor categories or, you know, what types of job titles might be uh, involved in this type of a project. Oh, okay. Now, like, write me some job descriptions. Give me some skill lists and technologies that we work with, and things like that, based upon that input. I think we could probably get pretty close. I think the one thing that you did mention, though, that I'd be interested to see how it plays out is uh, the project plan, right? Like, I, I think that it's probably, I think ChatGPT is probably as good at project planning as I am. <laughs> 
Um, yes. And- Chat GPT, you could use the mark. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I have Stephanie. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. And yeah. Uh, we'll need a second Chat GPT. Com- if, well, if Chat GPT comes after you now. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to load this into the interwebs and yeah, yeah you're in trouble. <laughs> awesome. <But> no, <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Thanks. Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate the questions. I think um, it, it's an interesting um, thought process. And this, and I, I believe this, right, that there's a lot of opportunity for solutions out there. I mean, this is, you know, this is a, a new frontier of sorts. Um, personally, I've had a hard time wrestling with it because I am a very people-centric, empathetic human. And it's hard for me to think of, of this in terms of robots that don't have feelings um, to, you don't know, have to, feelings to yet. take over. Don't have feelings yet. <laughs> Please don't. Don't do that to me. Don't do that to oh, me. Well, we really appreciate you being here, oh, It's Ross. good to be here. It's Thanks for really, having me. It's been a really good conversation. Appreciate that. Um, very insightful. And to everyone out there watching, thanks for making it to the end of the podcast. We look forward to entertaining you again. Smash that like button. Click subscribe. Like and subscribe. Smash it. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Yep.